Hey there, whether you're part of our church family or a friend tuning in, we love that you are here and pray that you might hear from God today. It is our joy to be able to provide access to teaching, worship, and other resources to equip and train the Church of Jesus. And while we are encouraged for you to benefit from these resources, we ask that they are only supplemental and no way replace a commitment to a gathering and learning within a local church. These resources are gifts of God's grace for people to grow with, but are never meant to replace our belonging to a covenant community of faith. If you'd like to learn more about Center Grove and what we're up to, head to cglife.org and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Center Grove. And if you'd like to reach out, just simply email info at cglife.org. Now, we pray that God stirs in your heart as you listen to the proclamation of His Word. Good morning, church family. How are you doing? Oh, excited, huh? <laughs> Good morning. Glad you guys are here. Thanks for bearing the elements a little bit. Uh, I think if we stay inside for the service, then it'll be great afterwards. It's like God's plan the whole time for you. So thankful you guys are here. My name's Adam. If we've not met, I'm one of the pastors here at Center Grove. And I have the honor to uh, introduce our guest pastor this morning. And so if you don't know uh, Dr. Gary Chapman, he's been a staple in our community here in Winston for 50 plus years. God brought his family here. He's been a teaching pastor and a discipleship pastor of marriages and families for a long time. And uh, I am so thankful as as I've gotten to know him and talk to him, just the the heart that he has, uh, not just what you hear here, it's, it's real and authentic off the stage as well. And I am so thankful so many years ago, while he was pastoring to families and, and marriages here, um, he had a burden to shepherd those that were not a part of his church body. And so he started writing books as the Holy Spirit gave him the burden to do so. And he wrote tons of books, a lot about parenting, a lot about marriage. The, the one you may know the most is the five love languages that, um, that is so familiar to all of us. It's been so helpful in, in my marriage, but then uh, so many of your others. And so if you don't know, that book has been very, very popular, been used by God many, many times. And so I was looking it up. It's been sold over 11 million times in English and it's been translated 40 into 49 different languages as it continues to uh, reach people for the kingdom. And I would, after again, having a conversation with him between services, uh, and you'll hear a little bit about it in his sermon today, he, he loves being able to uh, preach God's word, to share God's word, to, to write about God's word, but the joy of his heart is his family. And he'll talk a little bit about them today. But if you'll join me and please welcome Dr. Gary Chapman to the stage. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adam. It's great to be here. Can we just thank our worship team? Man, this was fabulous. Well, every line of every song was just powerful. So I hope you experienced that as uh, we worship together. Well, uh, today uh, I'm going to speak to you on Christian parenting. I'm looking out across here and I'm seeing a lot of young, a lot of children and a lot of parents, a few grandparents. Last hour we had more grandparents. Uh, But I want to talk, some of you may be saying, well, you know, I don't have children or my children are gone or whatever, whatever. Well, I want to couch all of this in terms of our heavenly father because he's our model. He's our father. If we've accepted Christ, we are his children So if we can figure out how God treats us, we have a perfect model of how we're to treat our children and our grandchildren. And if you're a child, I hope you'll stay awake so you can tell your mom and daddy what I said, okay? (laughs) All right. Well, let me suggest first of all, and I'm gonna use a a lot of scriptures, so I'm not gonna use one passage, so you you won't be able to look, look at them in your Bible, but if you take notes, you may wanna jot the references. You're certainly welcome to do that. First of all, I want to suggest that God meets his children's needs. And that's a model for us as parents and grandparents to meet our children's needs. Listen to these verses about God. Psalm 23, verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that word want means lack. I will not lack anything because God's my shepherd. He meets my needs. Romans chapter eight and verse 12, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us all things? God meets the needs of his children. Philippians chapter four, verse 19. 
and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Over and over again, the scriptures say that. As we were singing that, that first song we sang, you know, through all these years, you have been faithful, faithful. And I was think, sitting there thinking, man, Lord, it's been a long time in my life that you have been faithful through the years. So consequently, uh, we read this then about parenting, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Whoa, that's <laughs> pretty bad. So we're called upon as parents and grandparents to meet our children's needs. So let me talk about three of those needs. Most obvious are the physical needs. Food, clothing, shelter. As a matter of fact, if you are someone who serves as the parents of, of, of children, if someone doesn't do that for the children, you can forget the rest of it because they won't live. They're totally dependent upon us to meet their needs physically, okay? I'm not gonna talk much about that because I have an idea that uh, you're probably doing a great job with that. Secondly, emotional needs. And I wanna mention two or three of these emotional needs that a child has. First and fundamental, I believe, is the need to feel loved. To feel loved by the parents, to feel loved by the grandparents feel loved by anybody who's significant in their lives. I've often said this to parents. The question is not, do you love your children? The question is, do your children feel loved? He was 13 years old. He'd run away from home. He was sitting in my office and he said to me, my parents don't love me. They love my brother, but they don't love me. I knew his parents. I knew they loved him. The problem was they'd never learn how to speak love in a way that was meaningful to him. That's what led me to write the book, The Five Love Languages of Children and The Five Love Languages of Adults. If we don't discover the primary love language of a child or a teenager, and we don't speak that language on a regular basis, they do not feel loved, even though we love them in our hearts. We have an attitude of love toward them. Exceedingly important that we do that. Second is self-worth. Every child needs to have that sense that I'm worth something. Why do we believe that as Christians? Because every child is made in the image of God. Every child is important. Every child is gifted by God. Every child, God has a purpose for that, that child's life. Now in our culture, we've exalted three kinds of people. And if a child falls into one of these three categories, they probably have pretty good self-esteem. We've exalted people who are handsome or beautiful. And we've exalted people who are smart. If they make straight A's, they get a lot of affirmation. And we've exalted people who have strength. They become football players. And if you fall in one of those three categories, the child probably has pretty good self-esteem because our whole culture appraises them. But folks, let's be honest. The vast majority of us don't fall in those three categories. But we're worthy, we're valuable. And that child needs to hear that. You know, one of the saddest things in our culture today is the number of suicides that take place among children and teenagers who don't feel that they're worth living. As parents and grandparents, we wanna do everything we can to communicate the message to our children that they are worthy, they are worth something, they are, that God loves them and God made them and God, they have gifts and there's a wonderful life for them to live so that they have a sense of self-worth. And the other is security. A sense of security. And I can relax because my parents are there for me. You see, there are a lot of children who live with fear. Not only because of what's going on in our culture, but because of what's going on in their house. There's an alcoholic father who comes home and yells and screams and beats on them. And they go to sleep every night afraid of what's gonna happen. No, no, we're called upon to create a sense of security for our children. 
They hear a mother and daddy fighting all the time, yelling at each other all the time, and they're, they're down here wondering if that's the way they treat each other, how they're gonna treat me. So our marriages are important in how we treat each other in the marriage so that we create an attitude of security. Oh yeah, we don't always agree with our children. We don't always agree with each other, husband and wife, but we wanna treat each, treat each other with dignity and respect and create an atmosphere of security for our children. So those are some of the emotional needs. But then there are the spiritual needs. Above everything else, we want our children to come to have a relationship with a living God. Nothing's more important than that. That means that in those years, through the years, we have to be involved with them and talking about spiritual things, talking about God and talking about our relationship with God for our children. You know, it was very interesting. Several years ago, there was a young college grad who had moved to Winston-Salem and taken a teaching job in the public school. And he said to me, Dr. Chairman, would it be possible for me to move in and live with you and your wife for a year and just see what a healthy family looks like? He said, I grew up in a dysfunctional family and I don't, I don't even know what it would be like to, to have a healthy family. And I said what any wise man would say. Well, let me ask my wife about that. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife and I talked and we talked to the kids about it. My wife and the kids liked it. And I said, but where will he live? We, we only have three bedrooms and they're already full. And my wife said, well, you know, the basement doesn't have anything in it. We could just put a wall down there and create a room and cut off a corner and make a closet out of it. And he'd come upstairs for the bathroom. I said, but we only have two, you know. But you know, I thought, well, if they're game, why should I not? And we let him move in with us and live a whole year. I interviewed him when I wrote a book a while back on family and just asked him the impact that made on his life. So, so encouraging. And I was so glad that by that time in my life, we kind of had it together. I I'm glad he didn't ask to move in with us when I first got married or he would never have gotten married. Yeah, uh, but you know, he would sit there with us at breakfast every morning and my wife, my wife wakes up and, and fix breakfast. She committed to God. She's gonna fix a hot breakfast every morning for the kids. Man, oh, and she's not a morning person. I mean, she doesn't wake up till 10 o'clock. She fixes breakfast, but she's not awake. And, <laughs> and, and we would sit there and I'd read a verse every morning out of the Bible to my kids right there. At the t not a big long thing, just reading a verse and talking about how this might help us today in our life. And then every night, John would sit there with us as we had family devotions together. When they were little, we were reading Bible stories. As they got older, we were reading the Bible. We were talking and discussing how this applies in our lives. And then every single night, either I or my wife would go to their bedside and kneel by their bed and pray with them. And our son went to bed first because he was the youngest. And, and, and 15 minutes later, his, his sister went to bed. So we got the chance to pray with each of them every night. And John got to see all of that. So, you know, if we're gonna meet the spiritual needs of our children, we have to spend time exposing them to the things of God. And if we're gonna do that, then we have to make sure we're developing our relationship with God, you know, and spending time with God ourselves. He's our model. And then the second area that uh, I wanna address is the matter of teaching and discipling our children, or bringing discipline to them. I'm adding the word teaching in there because the word discipline has no meaning if there's not something that's been taught. Something's right and something's wrong. And so we teach first and then we discipline. That is, we make sure that they, all, as well as we can, that they follow the guidelines we've laid out. Listen to this uh, from, about God. This is Hebrews chapter 12, beginning verse five. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. You see, God loved us and God gave us principles to live by. Do this and don't do this. He laid it all out for us. And if we're his children, then if we get off track, he will discipline us. Why? Because he loves us. He wants to get us back on track because if we follow what he laid out for us, we're gonna have the best possible life. So God, as our father, disciplines all of his children. 
And he says, you know, if, you're not, if you're not disciplined by God, then you're not a son of, or a daughter of God because God loves us and he teaches and then he disciplines us. So he says, endure hardship as, as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? So if you're not disciplined, then you're, you're really not children of God. So uh, pretty good sign. If you can just do wrong, 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 and you don't ever get disciplined by God, you, you don't belong to God because God disciplines all of his children. And so we teach and discipline our children. I think it's important to note the steps that God made with ancient Israel in teaching and, bring, and then bringing discipline to them. Let me let's share those with you. First of all, God showed himself as the great provider, which we just talked about. Listen to this. This is Exodus chapter three, verse eight. God said to ancient Israel, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and I am going to deliver you. God revealed himself to ancient Israel as the great deliverer from the land of Egypt. Then he establishes authority. You may remember this. Moses had gone up on the mountain to ultimately receive the Ten Commandments. But before that happened, when Moses was on the mountain, the people were not allowed to go up the mountain. They were told to stand at the base of the mountain while Moses was on the mountain. And here's what happened. This is Exodus 19. As Moses went on the mountain and ascended the mountain, there was an earthquake and smoke rose from the mountain. What's going on? God is revealing himself to Israel as the one who's in authority. I am God. I can shake the earth. I can make smoke come out of the mountain. He's showing them that he is the authority because he's getting ready to give the Ten Commandments. And in family, parents are to be the authority. Children are not to be running households. Children are not to be making rules. It's the parents who make rules. You see, God knows what's best for us. And so God gave the rules as soon as he establishes authority. And sometimes as parents, in our culture especially, we can fail to recognize and help our children understand that we are the authority in the family. I remember when my son was going through some early teenage years. And I would say to him, you know, Derek, I really appreciate what you're saying and I can see how you would feel that. I mean, that makes sense to me. But now, let me just remind you of one thing. I'm the father and you're the son. And remember, we've talked about this before. I have to make the rules that I believe are gonna be healthy for you. So I'm not going to agree to do something that you just want to do just because you want to do it. I'm gonna agree if I feel like it would be good for you, but I'm not, you know, I'm the father and you're the son. And we need to establish that with our children so that they recognize that, you know. Children are not to be running households. I've shared this illustration before, you know. How do you get a dress on a three-year-old? I mean, honey, we gotta to go to church now, let's get your dress on, and the three-year-old says their favorite word. No. Oh, honey, grandmother gave you this dress. No. Oh, honey, look at the pretty ducky-wuckies. No. How do you get a dress on a three-year-old? You stuff her in it. It's got one head for the hole and two for the arms. It takes three seconds to dress a three-year-old. See, folks, it, just, it, we're, not, we're not, you know, harsh and angry. We're just, it's just, we're the authority in the family because we love our children. We want what's best for them. And then, number three, God gave the rules. After he established his authority, we call them the Ten Commandments. And you notice about half of them are don't do this and the other half are do this. God told us what not to do and told us what to do. And all of those commandments were out of a heart of love. He knew that if we didn't do these things and we did these things, we were gonna have the best possible life on earth. 
But you know how the, do you notice this? In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve was there, there was only one negative. Don't eat of that tree. All the rest of the rules were positive. Take care of the animals, take care of the dead, dead, dead. All, all these things they were to do, but only one thing they weren't supposed to do. And here, it's about half and half. Then we come to the New Testament, and Jesus said, you have read, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you have anger in your heart toward them, you've committed murder already. Whoa, it's getting harder. The rules are changing. I think because we're different. Listen, we know much more about God than ancient Israel did because God revealed himself in Jesus. And since Jesus, we have a much better picture of what God is like. And so God expects even more of us. But notice, it's because his spirit is now with us. The song was saying it. It's not I, but it's, it's your, your spirit within me. God expects more of us even than he did ancient Israel. But he did, he did give the rules then and now. And so parents are to establish rules. And number four, God rewarded obedience. Now, I've heard people say, well, I don't think you should reward children for just doing what's right. Well, God does. Listen to this verse. This is Psalm 19, verse 11. The psalmist says this about God's, God's laws. By them is your servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. If you want the best possible life on earth, you just follow the teachings of Jesus. If he says, don't do this, don't do it. If he says, do this, do it. And you're gonna have the best possible life. God rewards those who follow his laws. And then number five, God let them suffer the consequences when they broke the rules. As parents, we make the rules, but we should also let the child know what the consequences are if they don't keep the rules. And then we should let them suffer the consequences. So you have a 16 year old and they wanna drive and you've agreed to let them drive the family car. Or maybe you bought them a, a, an old junker or maybe you're rich and bought them a new car. But with that gift and with that expression, there should be some rules about the car. Things like, okay, on Saturdays, I want you to wash the car and vacuum the car every Saturday before noon or one o'clock, whatever you want to say. And if you don't do it, then you're going to lose the privilege for two days, okay? And when you're driving on the highway, always watch the speed limit because if you get a speed ticket, you're going to lose the car for five days. Okay, got it? Okay. Yeah. Teenager will accept that. Yeah, it's okay. So here we go. And the first Saturday or the second Saturday, it's one o'clock and they're not, that, the car hadn't been washed. Or it's 11 o'clock and you don't see them moving. You don't go in there and say, you, you remember, 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 no, 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 no. Your kids are smart. They heard the consequences. All you have to do is let it happen. Say, son, I'm so sorry. But you know, you're gonna have to lose the car for two days. Oh, dad, but, oh, I know, son. I'd be upset too if I were you. But you remember the rule, and we always follow the rules, or we have to suffer the consequences. Huh. Folks, that won't happen but twice, and you'll have the cleanest car in the neighborhood. Yeah. Every child at different ages, they, we have different rules and different ages, but always consequences. Let them know what it is. And if you know what the consequences are, you're less likely to overreact because you know what the consequences are and they know what the consequences are. So we follow the example of God when we set the consequences and let our children suffer the consequences. So what's our objective in teaching and disciplining our children? It's to bring them to independence. You see, when they're little, they're totally dependent on us. They will not live if we are not active in their lives. And as they get older, they're still dependent on us. And in our culture, we have 18 years. And at that juncture, typically, they're gonna go off to university or they're gonna join the military. They're gonna get a job. We, we hope they're gonna be, and, and somewhere along the line there, they're gonna be actually moving away from home and you won't be there. 
At the university, they don't allow parents to be there every day. Yeah. I remember when we left our daughter at uh, uh, Davidson College and we were we moved her in and we had gone to the car and we looked back at her and we got in the car and I said to Carolyn, if we're ever going to cry, this is the time to cry. And we just sat there and cried. Yeah, no, that, it, it just goes, we, she won't be here tonight. You know, she's down here. We're back there. We're not going to see her, you know. Yeah, that's normal, normal emotions. But that, that's what we're preparing them for. That when they get out there on their own, when they can make their own decisions, we want them to be able to make wise decisions. We want them to have a relationship with God and realize that, that there are certain things we don't do and certain things we do. And we want them to be spending time with God while they're at the university or wherever they've gone. And we want them to be able to make their own decisions now between them and God. We want them to make good decisions. So that's our objective and why we seek to do our teaching and also let them suffer the consequences. And then number three, as parents, we're to have fellowship with our children. See, this is the wonderful thing about God. He revealed himself as our father and he calls us his children. And he wants to spend, content, he wants to spend time with us. Exodus chapter 25, he said this to ancient Israel. Exodus 25 verse eight. He said, build me a house, the temple, Build me a house and I'll come down and dwell with you. I'll come down and have fellowship with you. Now, if Galatians chapter four, verse six, in our day, because you are sons of God, daughters of God, God sent his spirit, the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Father. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, lives in every Christian. The Bible says our body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have access to God every moment of every day. And if, that's, if we're gonna make the most of that, I think there needs to be a conscious time that we just sit down with God every day. And say, God, I'm so glad to sit down here with you. And I'm gonna read this chapter in the Bible and I'm listening to you. Whatever I need to hear, I wanna hear it. And you read that chapter and you take your pen and whatever jumps out, you just underline it. And then you go back when you finish the chapter and you read what you've underlined and you have a conversation with God about what you've underlined and you and God have a little conversation. And if you do that every day, and it doesn't have to be in the morning, I do it in the morning because I'm a morning person, but some time every day that you sit down and have conscious fellowship with God. And if you do, you'll learn to have fellowship with God all day long. And you'll just talk about, you'll talk with God off and on all day long. And when I go to the bank, I say to God on my way up to the bank, Lord, it'd sure be nice if the line is short. When I pull in a parking, big parking lot, I say, Lord, help me find a place here in the midst of all this. Yeah. I mean, God's concerned about everything. You could talk to him about everything, have fellowship with him about everything. And so as parents, we're called to have fellowship with our children, to share life with our children and our grandchildren as we have an opportunity. Now, this means that we have to go to where the children are because they can't come to where we are so if they're little and they're crawling on the floor and you want to have fellowship, then get on the floor. You let them crawl all over you. Yeah. Then they go to the sandbox and we go to the sandbox and then we go to bicycles. And, then, and we do fairly well as parents when they're little. But when they get to be teenagers, we don't always want to go where they are. So what do they do? They go down the street and find someone who will go where they are. And we miss out on having fellowship. I remember when my son got into Buddy Holly. Now, you younger folks will not know Buddy Holly, but he was a rock star. My son got into him, and when he did, I got into Buddy Holly. I listened to his music, and I wrote down things I liked about it. And I said, hey, Derek, I like this. Listen to this, man. Da, 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 da. And one day I said to him, Derek, I've got to go to Fort Worth, Texas to speak, so why don't you go with me? 
And when I get through speaking, you and I will drive out to Lubbock and we will visit Buddy's hometown. Oh, Dad, I'd love to do that. I had no idea how far it was from Fort Worth to Lubbock. <laughs> it's a long ride and not a, lot, not a lot out there, but railroad tracks and tumbleweed. We got there, we went to the Chamber of Commerce. They gave us three pages on Buddy Holly. We went to the house where he was born. Actually, the house was gone, but I took a picture of my son on the lot where Buddy Holly's house used to be. Went to, the, went to every school he attended. We went to saw the school. We went to the church where he got married and where they had his funeral. We went out to the cemetery, and uh, I gave my son a little time alone at the cemetery there. And eventually, we drove back all the way to Fort Worth talking about, I wonder what would have happened to Buddy Holly if he hadn't died in that plane crash. And I wonder if he really was a Christian because we went to the church and the, the youth pastor said Buddy was a Christian and he was baptized in that church. I said, Derek, maybe we can see Buddy in heaven. Woo, won't that be good? Now, folks, can I be honest? I didn't care about Buddy Holly. He was already dead. But I cared a whole lot about my son. Are you with me? Spending time with our children, just fellowshipping, just doing things that they enjoy and we enjoy, hanging out with them. And it takes time. And that may be the hardest part in our culture, time. In fact, I was, I, I was, at, a, I was at a funeral a year or so ago and I didn't know the young man's, I didn't know the man's son. And I found out in, in talking with him, he was 25 years old and I hadn't met him before. I was just having a little conversation after the service was over at the grave. And I said, what kind of relationship did you have with your father? And he said, Dr. Chapman, I didn't know my father. I said, what, what do you mean by that? He said, well, my dad had a job that took him out of, out of town all week. He left Monday and he came back late Friday night. And he said, on Saturday, most of the day, he spent playing golf with his friends. And on Sunday, he slept till noon. And then after lunch, he watched football on TV. And he said, I never got to know my father. And I walked away with tears in my eyes. And I thought, how sad. He did a good job supporting the family. He did number one. I mean, he made the money and he, he, he took care of getting him through college and all that stuff. He did all that well. But no fellowship with his son. See, it, it's, worth, it's worth guys and gals making radical changes to have time to fellowship with your children. This is the gravy part. Yeah, my father, and I didn't realize, I didn't realize this until I was older, but I grew up in a little town called China Grove. Not, not the one the Doobie Brothers sang about, but right, right down the road here. It's a textile town. And everybody works in the textile mill. And there's three shifts, seven in the morning, until three in the afternoon, and three in the afternoon until 11 o'clock at night, and 11 o'clock at night till seven o'clock in the morning. And my father worked on the third shift, 11 o'clock at night till seven in the morning. And then while we were in school, he slept during the day. And I didn't realize, why didn't dad take the second shift? Because you have to work your way up. You start on the third, you go to the second, then you go to the first. And my dad didn't go to the second because he, he didn't want to go to the second. He said, I want to stay on the third. Because when he slept during the day, when we got home from school, he was there. And we spent all afternoon and evening together. And yeah, part of it was he, he wanted to teach us how to work in the garden. And I, I, I get that too, you know. But that, that was fellowship. I mean, planting beans together is fellowship. And, and I look back at when I realized why he chose that. I thought, man, what a dad. Yeah, so make time. Let's make time to be with our children and have fellowship with our children. Now, it, as I said, it requires time. It also requires planning. You have to plan some things you want to do, you know. Some research was done among middle-class fathers and they were asked, how much time did you spend talking with your child or your children every day? How much time do you spend talking to them every day? And they said, the average was 30 to 40 minutes a day. They went into the home of those same fathers and put a microphone on their children 
and actually recorded for one week how much time those fathers spent talking with their children. And they found it was 37 seconds per day. See, we may have the sense that we're doing more fellowship with our children than we really are. So let's, 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 let's be stewards. Let's, let's think about it. And let's, let's enjoy the gravy part of having fellowship with our children. And grandparents, the same as you have an opportunity. Well, let me give you three application points to what I've said today. And let me just say this to the children. I see a few children here. Since your mom and dad set the rules and they let you suffer the consequences, there's two words for children. Children, obey your parents. And children, honor your parents. So if you want the best possible life as you grow up, obey your parents and show honor and respect to your parents, okay? So here are my three application points. Number one, to parents and grandparents, pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Folks, none of us are capable of being good parents without the help of God. And the Bible says if you lack wisdom, ask and God will give you wisdom. Secondly, read. Read the Bible, first of all. If you wanna be good parents and grandparents, read the Bible. Spend that daily time with God. So you know what God expects of us and that you know that we have the help of God to do these things. Read, read the Bible, but read, read books on parenting and on marriage. The ones I brought today uh, were, uh, let's see, Five Love Language of Children, Five Love Language of Teenagers, Things I Wish I'd Known Before We Became Parents. Still got children at home, you'd, you'll find that helpful. Things I wish I'd known before our children became teenagers. Whew. I wish I'd done a lot more reading back then. I don't know if they had books back then, but yeah, those will help you. And then there's one out there called The Family You've Always Wanted. And that book, I tell the story about that young man that moved in our house and lived with us that year. But I talk about what a healthy family looks like. Yeah, so if you want those, they're out there. Out there. And then enjoy your children. Enjoy your children and your grandchildren. Make the most of it. Just enjoy them. And then number four, confess the failures of the past. You know, none of us are perfect. You don't have to be perfect to be good parents or grandparents. And sometimes we blow it. And the, the ideal is, if we blow it with our children, is that we would immediately apologize. If we yell and scream and lose our temper, we first of all get along with God and confess to God that we haven't been, hadn't treated them well. And then go to the child and say, listen, no father or no mother should talk to a child the way I talk to you. I lost my temper and that's not right. And I want to ask you to forgive me. That's the ideal, you just, you, as soon as it happens. But you know what I find today? There's a lot of, a lot of adult children who have fractured relationships with their parents because of something that happened along the way. And the parents are just, they're heartbroken that the kids won't have anything to do with them now. Some of them won't even let them see their grandkids. Just fractured relationships. Well, we're not responsible for what our adult children do, but we are responsible for our own lives. And so if there's a fracture, maybe you could just sit down with God and say, Lord, where did I fail along the way? What are the things I did or didn't do? And just let God bring them to your mind and write them down and then confess them to God. And maybe, maybe your adult child is 25, has 95% of the problem and maybe it's only 5% where you fail, but write them down. And then if they'll let you, if you can interface with them, just say to them, you know, I've been thinking a lot about my life as I've gotten older. And I know that our relationship is fractured. And I just sat down the other day and asked God to show me where I failed when you were growing up. And he gave me a pretty good list. And I've asked God to forgive me of these. And I'd like to read these to you. And I don't know if you can find in your heart to forgive me or not, but I want to share them with you and ask 
if you can, maybe, forgive me. And you just read them to them. And I can't guarantee you that they'll immediately just forgive you. But I can tell you this, I've seen it over and over many times. That's the first step in reconciling with an adult child. Because when they see that you're honest and willing to admit your own failures and not blaming them, God, does, God uses that to touch their hearts and there can be some reconciliation. Now, it takes, takes both parties, I understand. But let me encourage you, let's deal with our failures as we move through life. Let me pray for you. And as we do, I wanna give you a chance to pray for your children or your grandchildren. And if you children could pray for your parents, that God would give them wisdom. Father, thank you that we could gather together in this place today and worship you. Thank you for the truth of the songs that we sang earlier. Thank you that you are our Father and that you do all of these things for us. And Father, as parents and grandparents, we do wanna ask you for wisdom. Wherever we are in the journey, that you'll give us wisdom on how to be good parents and good grandparents. And we pray, Father, that in every heart that's here, we'll recognize that we will never have the best life in this life without you. For those who may be wondering, I pray that your spirit would draw them back home. And I pray for those that may not know you, that your spirit would whisper your love into their hearts and they will know that you want them to come be your child. We also take a moment, Father, now to pray for our children and our grandchildren. And we also want to thank you for our parents. Some are already with you, others are still here. And if they're still here, show us how to best honor them. May our lives be different because we came to church today. And may your spirit be active in our hearts and in our minds throughout this week. I pray this for our good and for your glory. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. As we sing our last song, I hope you will sing it from your heart to God. And obviously, if you want to come forward and pray, you can certainly kneel here. If you want to talk, we can talk with you if you need to. But let's, let's stand as we close our service today. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to dig deeper into this message, you can access a discussion guide right where you found this message, either on the website or over at the Center Grove app. Also, head to cglife.org to learn more about Center Grove, what we're up to, and how to access even more resources. Thanks again for opening God's Word with us today. We hope that you've been encouraged and challenged to walk deeper in relationship with Him.